welcome to Giving Back is Dead. First, we'd like to thank Offscreen for hosting the series of conversations, and in particular to its director, Julian Friedman, and to Jean-Daniel Campin, its senior producer. Giving Back is Dead is a series of conversations on next generation thoughts on giving to the arts. In, in this series, we're talking to an art, a millennial art advisor, a millennial collector, and a millennial artist. And today, we're, we're talking with Keith Rivers. Welcome, Keith. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come with us. So, Keith, you are known as a past pro NFL player and have become a rather well-known collector. Tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to arts. So, as you mentioned, I'm Keith, uh, Keith Rivers. I played in the NFL for seven years after being drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals. I spent four years in Cincinnati and two years in New York with the Giants and then uh, finished my career in Buffalo. Uh, after retiring from the NFL, I worked in real estate finance for about 16 months before realizing that I wanted to spend more time uh, traveling the world and seeing art. Um, mm -hmm. I got into collecting probably 2010, let's call it, while I was uh, still playing. and. Um, didn't really necessarily have a focus in collecting, but uh, at a certain point decided uh, I wanted to get focused after I watched the uh, documentary Art of the Steel about the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia. Um, from seeing that, I, um, you know, I got motivated to see how I can be like him or uh, take it as far as he did. And why? Why were you interested in the arts? What happened that the arts called to you? Um, you know, I got interested in it after learning about the conceptual side and uh, learning that art has the ability to change the way you think and um, change the way you grasp concepts. Uh, for me, playing sports, I wasn't necessarily uh, spending a lot of time in my younger years reading literature and, you know, through arts I've been able to um, catch up, per se, on a lot of the things I miss uh, as far as literature-wise and learning-wise and um, learning through the artist's eyes. When you were at USC, they didn't you weren't looking at art? They didn't take you? USC doesn't do art? No, my art. <laughs> we do have a nice art collection at the, uh, at the, at the school, but, um, and we also have tons of great galleries and museums in the city, but uh, that was not my focus. And um, I actually went to New York City with art history major and was introduced to Oldenburg. And uh, from there, I got, I got very curious. I also had friends that were telling me, Keith, you got to collect, you got to collect. So, um, you know, after that experience at that, uh, the MoMA show, I got very, uh, very, very curious. And then, as I said, I ended up watching that Barnes collection um, and got a, somewhat of a focus. And what about the Barnes collection? Why, why that collection? Uh, it was just amazing to see what he did. I think uh, if you know his story, Albert Barnes came uh, kind of from the wrong side of the tracks in Philadelphia and then uh, went on to school to become a scientist and created this drug called Argerol. And then from there, he uh, developed, decided he wanted to collect art. He actually moved to Europe uh, for a year or two and learned how to speak French, learned how to speak German, and um, developed a great relationship with artists and built this incredible collection that's probably on par with any museum in Europe or, or the United States. And uh, uh, I thought it was amazing to do that. You know, for me, um, being an athlete, you always talk to kids and you tell them, hey, it's all about repetition and, and whatnot. It's not necessarily about uh, how big you are, you know, how smart you are. but um, you know, it doesn't really resonate with them. So I thought, how great is it that I can be somebody who comes from the opposite world, the antithesis of, of sports, art, do, do, do art, which is the antithesis of sports, and um, show that you can do anything you put your mind to if you're sufficiently tenacious about it. I think we can integrate sports with art. I think so. <laughs> you know, sports are all about repetition. I think art is about repetition. To some extent, yeah. yes. So, you know, there's been a lot of attention on, about you as a collector. You've had a lot of papers, a lot of talks, and you know that why I wanted us to have this conversation is I think there hasn't been sufficient attention and focus on the other work that you do, on your nonprofit work. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, the nonprofit work in its various forms that you've done. And perhaps we can begin you talking a bit about your involvement with museums. You're a trustee at a few institutions. Tell us about which institutions and why you decided to become a trustee there. Uh, I guess I'll start with the Hirshhorn. Um, when Dan Salek, the president of the Board of Trustees, reached out to me, uh, it was just a great opportunity 
I felt like I was ready at that point to step up in the level of uh, contributions that I had been making to museums and also my time uh, that I've been given to museums. Uh, within meeting a lot of the people with the museum at the Hirshhorn, whether it be Sandra Mercer or, or um, Rick Powell, who is the illustrious teacher at Duke University, it's, uh, I, I thought it was, it, was the right, um, it was the right place to be. Um, DC is a, is a great place and has a great collection of art and um, also Melissa Chu is a complete force and I was told by my network, if you have the opportunity to work with her, you should jump at that opportunity. So um, I was excited to get on board with Melissa and then from Melissa Chu and the Hirshhorn, I joined up uh, the Walker, uh, which Mary Cerruti and the work she did with the uh, Sculpture Center collection has just been uh, remarkable. And you know, for me, uh, joining an institution that is smaller per se or in the Midwest, as in the case of the Walker, presented me an opportunity to learn how I can evolve my collecting in a sense the same way that they do because they're smaller museums with not unlimited funds like a MoMA or the Guggenheim and uh, still punch above their weight class per se and, um, and what they do. And I think that's how I have to do in collecting because I don't have unlimited funds, but I can be a little bit more nimble and smarter. So if we go back, you did not have any involvement with Washington, D.C. prior to? Uh, no involvement with Washington, D.C. outside of going there because I loved seeing their collection, whether it's Glenstone or the Hirshhorn, obviously, and uh, the National Gallery and, or the National Portrait Gallery. So it was really, it was really I just saw Melissa yesterday. It was you know, fantastic. Yeah. So, um, so tell us more about specifically what do you feel, if we talk first about the Hirshhorn and then about the Walker, what do you bring to that group of trustees? What do they look for from you? And what do you think about your contribution there? Uh, I hope I'm giving enough of a contribution, but I look more to, to learn from everybody that's been there. Um, and I just hope to add some of the things that I've learned from my friends who are artists, like uh, artist Piero Gorlia or at the Astor Gates, who's at the Astor Gates, who's actually on the board of trustees for the Hirshhorn as well. Um, I think for me, uh, one thing that I've actually learned through Theaster is, you know, we talk about what we talk about building all these wings in museums, but you know, what do we do about the artists who can't afford to live in these cities once they get too big? And these cities that inspire all the artists to um, for us to go to these museums, right? Like, do we care more about the artists, do we care, or do we care more about the, you know, the things that are in the museums, the objects? So, um, I hope that I can contribute. Uh, a sense of wanting to bring the artist to the forefront, forefront and making the artist first. I, I don't know enough about the Hirshhorn, but do they have outreach to the community? How, how is their audience? I mean, are they looking for you to bring some kind of sense of outreach to a larger community on diversity issues or things like that? I think they do a great job with, the, with their audience, and whether it be social media or some of the other things, the other initiatives that um, Melissa and the, the whole museum is doing. But um, there's some things that I would like to do at like some what? point. Tell us what you would <laughs> like to do. <laughs> um, I think that the Underground Museum in Los Angeles created the perfect example of how to get the art to the people, right? Um, I don't know if everybody knows the story tell, about the Underground tell, Museum. Tell but, I think it's a, good, it's a good story. Right? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, when I first went to the Underground Museum, because I was contributing at a, local, at a lower level for MOCA, I realized that um, when they started it, they couldn't get loans. They started a museum in uh, West Adams neighborhood, and they couldn't get loans for various reasons. Uh, so they created this exhibition called The Imitation of Wealth, which really uh, brought people to, uh, to understand that there are communities that are underserved that don't necessarily have the opportunity to get there. So I like the idea of uh, bringing the art to people, whether it be like, for me, I play football, so maybe uh, all this art that's in storage, maybe we can put it in the stadium. So when these 60,000 people or so who don't nem normally get exposed to art uh, come to the game, maybe they can get a sense of some culture as well as uh, a good football game. I wanted to talk about that more. Why don't we go and talk about that now? Yes. You've talked to me a little bit about this idea of bringing art to the football audience and also the football players. Tell us what your thoughts are about that and what has your experience been in trying to get that happen? Because I think it's an incredibly interesting initiative. Yeah, I think um, some stadiums are doing it to a, to a, to a certain degree, but uh, my thoughts are it's I would love to find a, a player that's on the team that, that has a heart for art and has a heart for giving. Um, Tuesday is the, the day that everybody has off in the NFL to do to give back. 
So I thought it would be interesting if we could uh, have the team or that certain player who has a heart for art to um, come up with a theme to curate a show around the museum and also have the kids that don't normally get to see art come to the, uh, come to the stadium and walk around with that player or the players and uh, also curators and then you know, get, a, get to experience art and then after that you know, go check out the stadium like they would normally want to, but uh, get them a double dose of football and art. It seems like an incredibly compelling idea to me. Why, why hasn't it happened yet? Um, a number of reasons. I mean, I, I think um, it should happen in more, more, more facets, whether it's, hey, there's a window shop, and let's create something similar to what the underground did. I, I just think that the art needs to get there instead of being in storage, right? There's only so much exhibition space that a museum can have, and uh, I think we should uh, get the art to the people. And your idea is that you would actually, you'd like to work with the museums to be able to do this? I would like to, I would like, because they have so much excess yeah. art, right? To me, this makes a lot of sense. Have you tried to work with museums on this idea? Uh, I have. It's been okay. We've made some inroads with the, uh, obviously, the Walker and uh, in Minnesota and the Minnesota Vikings, um, but we, we talk stalled, so we haven't been able to do that. But it's been interesting to see what the Los Angeles Rams have been doing with the Kissington collection and, uh, you know, obviously the Dallas Cowboys have a tremendous art collection, but I would like to see them activate it. And uh, hopefully I can be involved if you're listening, Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who would not want you to get involved. <laughs> well, I think, that, I think it's a great idea. And I think you should, uh, I think it should, the museums should be interested. And if you want my advice, I think you should push it. Because I think that it's something that, that can be done and should be done easily for all the reasons that you say. So talk a little bit about the walker and what you do with the walker and... Uh, you know, when you're on the board of trustees, there's all these different subcommittees and subgroups, so I've had the pleasure to be involved with uh, the acquisitions committee and, you know, other committees, and I think it's, it's you know, it's an awesome opportunity to, to get your voice out there, and I think also working with a smaller museum or a, um, you know, a mid-level mid museum, per se, uh, you have a bigger voice and you can uh, get some of your ideas out there and, you know, working with great people like Melissa Chu and uh, Mary Cerruti, you have an excellent opportunity to have those, those ideas and those, those, those thoughts enacted. Give us an example of some of the ideas you've tried to bring to the walker. Um, well, I'll give you an example of an idea with, uh, with the Hirshhorn, actually. We just had a panel, and I got to speak on the panel with the, the illustrious Rick Powell, who's got many books out and uh, is a great teacher at Duke. Uh, we got to talk about the artist residencies, because um, I think when you're... Uh, I think the best institutions are the ones that have residencies and give artists the opportunity to, you know, live in these cities and uh, and push further their ideas without having the pressure of having to have a show per se. And so you did that with the Hirshhorn? What yeah, we did it. We actually did a panel recently uh, talking about how we could push that initiative forward and, and how we can um, use all the excess college campus space or college campus dormitories that are in that area to um, to make this initiative happen at some point. And will it happen, do you think? Fingers crossed, I hope so. <laughs> now, as you know, we both, we both live, our bases are, uh, for both of us, Los Angeles. And people have asked me, why is Keith not on a board of a museum in Los Angeles? So I feel compelled to ask you this question. Uh, well, see the way my bank account works. No. <laughs> um, I think that, um, you know, I, I've done work with MoCA and uh, actually has been on the board of advisors for the Hammer. But um, again, I like being in a, a museum that, um, that can kind of mimic the way I collect a, a smaller museum that uh, I think it also, I don't mean to have a quid pro pro, but uh, I want to learn from a museum that has a smaller endowment and has to work a little bit harder to, to make an impact because I think that I do in the way I collect. Well, tell us about what other involvements you have in nonprofit sector to the arts, because there are other things, and the most important thing is not necessarily uh, being a trustee and giving a chunk of money somewhere to a big museum. What else are you doing? You're doing some other things with the arts. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, being in the philanthropic area has always been a part of my life uh, as being a football player, whether it be, as I mentioned on Tuesday, the NFL has the day that they give back. So I've always kind of, either whether it be, be smoking, speaking to kids at, uh, at schools on, on Tuesdays or 
uh, in the off season going to Skid Row to help out with homeless children. Um, I've always been engaged in that, also working with a group called Young Life to help um, kids with their graduation rates. Uh, kids who participate in the program went from the low 20% graduation rate to the 90 percentile. And I think one of my favorite uh, non for profits that I work with is uh, with a friend of mine who I mentioned earlier, Pio Golia, who has the Mountain School, uh, which brings talented artists from all over the world to LA for a month to engage with uh, artists and professionals throughout the city of Los Angeles. Well, that's great. I, I don't know enough about it. Tell me a little bit more and how you're involved with them. Um, so I'm involved with it. Sometimes I, I, well, I've spoken at it for the last three years. And so usually he gets a venue and brings these. 15 to 20 artists from all over the world to you know, hang out in LA for a month and go meet with everybody. But during the pandemic, it was great that I got the opportunity to host a number of times. Uh, so it was actually a benefit for me as well because uh, we we're in my backyard and having the talks and I got to have Albert Olin and, and my house, you know, and listen to him talk where there's uh, Andrew Berardini. You didn't invite me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's for the kids. Oh, I see, it's for the kids. Well, the students rather, not just the kids. Are there other nonprofits founded by people of color that feel that are inspirational to you or you think are doing interesting work? Um, like what do you think about art and practice, for instance, which is the obvious one? I think it's amazing what art and practice is doing and what they've been trying to do as far as um, take over that whole community and make it uh, more art centric and because it's a, uh, you know, Lamarck Park is historically a uh, black area in that area and Mark Bradford and Eileen Norton have done a tremendous job of uh, putting together uh, world-class shows there, whether it be right now Thaddeus Mosley at the moment or the Deborah Roberts show or Singa Nguidi. Uh, it's, been, it's been awesome to go to that area and, and see the impact and the kind of art that they've been able to bring to the, the area. Maybe for those of us, who, the people here who might not know about art and practice, do you want to talk about what it is a bit? Yeah, art and practice is um, something that was developed by the artist Mark Bradford. I think I want to say he grew up in in the West Adams area, and um, at a certain point in time, he, him and Eileen Norton got together and took it over and uh, built a beautiful uh, exhibition space. And you know, they've been buying a little bit more of the a uh, little bit more of the area and, and opening um, opening. They have, I think they have a restaurant. They have a, a library type space where you can do talks and and uh, salons. Have you thought about starting your own nonprofit? Um, I think that's what kind of the work with museums is doing, you know, so I, I've got a chance to understand the art world from the collecting point of view and, you know, when you're collecting you get to understand the art world from the gallery perspective as well, but now I get to understand the art world from uh, the museum perspective, so I think it, one day hopefully it helps me figure out what I want to do. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the Barnes is kind of an inspiration for me. As a former football player, you always had these people you look up to. And uh, Barnes is definitely one of them. And what he created in Philadelphia, or at least what he tried to with the foundation, being a learning center and not just a, uh, a gallery, is something I would, I would love to explore if I ever have the opportunity. I think, as you know, the whole um, idea behind this series of conversations, Giving Back is Dead, is for those of us who believe in the arts and the future support of the arts to be able to find a way to engage the next generation. And in recent conversations I've been having, recently recorded, one of the themes seems to be that the arts uh, nonprofit institution activity has to be able to demonstrate some kind of social impact in order to be able to engage the next generation. Is that something that seems relevant to you as well? I think so. I mean, um, I think that's why I've gotten into um, help supporting museums on a, on a bigger level so that I can have some type of social impact. And um, I think whenever you contribute to a museum, you're trying to be a part of that social impact. And you know, me being a person of color and being on a level of the board of trustee, I think is having a certain, certain level of social impact. And hopefully um, I can influence others to feel more comfortable in the space, uh, whether it be the galleries or also uh, coming to museums. Um, I'm always trying to influence uh, friends of mine who, who've played uh, in the NFL and have a certain level of means to g get involved so that they can, because uh, at some point you are some type of role model. So um, I think it's a great, it's a great idea or a great, uh, great position to be in to show people that they can uh, engage with art. Now I think we've talked a bit, and we've talked a bit outside of these conversations about diversity, diversity issues. Do you in general feel optimistic that this whole art infrastructure 
will be able to address issues of diversity and diversity on all different levels? I think that's the plan and uh, I think that's the hope, at least for me. Um, also engaging you know, the stadiums with art. I think that uh, especially right now when you have uh, a certain, um, sub, a sub, certain section of art that's very in vogue and popular uh, being art from artists of color in the African diaspora, I think it, uh, it would be great if you could get uh, you know, guys, who play, guys who play in sports to, you know, encourage, as I said, there are role models to encourage um, a, a younger generation of people of color to, to get involved in collecting, whether it be, and I think there are people doing it, like LeBron James, I think, has uh, been very, uh, very good about, you know, posting pictures of his collection, people like Jay-Z as well. What about leadership of museums, obviously black artists, uh, curators, writers, all of that? How do you see the future, the next five, ten years? Uh, I hope it looks bright. It you seems think, like you think it is. You feel I, optimistic. I feel optimistic. I mean, I think you can only be optimistic, and um, I, I think it will happen. Hopefully, you know, some of the barriers of entry to to doing those jobs get a little bit uh, get torn down. Are there some practices that you think arts nonprofits should be doing that they're not doing? Uh, I think everybody can follow the example of the Underground Museum, um, LAX Art, things like that. I mean, what uh, the Underground, did, Underground Museum did for Los Angeles is uh, nothing short of amazing. I mean, uh, whenever for the last five years before they unfortunately ended, uh, that's all you could hear about whenever you talked about LA. The first thing people said is you had to see what Art and Practice was doing. I mean, sorry, uh, the Underground, Underground Museum was doing, uh, and also Art and Practice, but uh, and also Thelma, Thelma, which is doing with the Studio Museum, but... Um, well, Thelma is really the, uh, yeah, yeah. the role model for everybody. I think so, too. <laughs> Even out of this sector. Well, Keith, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate okay. it. <laughs> voilà. Finish. <laughs>